Hello and welcome. It's your friendly neighborhood narrator, Sue, here. Get cozy as I share with you. Sometimes terrifying, sometimes heartwarming, but always thought provoking encounters of Bigfoot, Dogman, and the straight up paranormal. I post new videos every day, so be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And with that, let's get right into it. When I was 24, I was at a party with my friends on the shore of Shaver Lake in California. We were partying and having a great time. The music was loud and we were all pretty drunk. At one point, a powerful scream echoed through the area, sounding like it originated from above us. We turned and saw what looked like a large man standing on the cliff edge. Honestly, I thought it was a real giant, like you see in fantasy movies, only it was a lot creepier looking, based on its silhouette. Since the scream was so high-pitched, I initially worried that the huge man had slaughtered a woman, maybe even one of our friends, up on the cliff. But soon we watched the giant's jaw open wide, and another one of those horrendous screams came out. It didn't move for a few seconds after that. I sensed it was waiting and observing our next move. But it wasn't long before it picked up a large tree branch and hurled it onto the ground, crushing our fold-out tables containing various drinks and snacks. We all jumped out of the way to avoid being hit by objects. It was so scary. After that, it was no longer in sight. but. We scrambled to get away out of there, for we worried it might head down to our level. We drove to town in near silence. We felt too shaken to talk. We told a few locals about what had happened when we got to a pizza restaurant parking lot. That was when we learned that the area had many reported Sasquatch sightings. The people we spoke to hadn't seen them, but they were good friends with people who had. I've never been back to Shaver Lake since that day. I've been too frightened. It was the scariest experience of my life. But recently, I've decided that I'm going back to Shaver Lake with my boyfriend. I want him to accompany me to where I saw the Sasquatch. I'm going to force myself not to be afraid. I won't let fear stop me from enjoying a place I once loved dearly. Did you like that last encounter? If you did, be sure to hit that like button. Okay, on to the next one. I had never wanted to tell my story publicly before because I was always afraid I would be mocked, called a liar, or even worse, considered mentally unstable. However, very recently, I was searching online for similar experiences which I've been trying to find since this happened to me and a friend of mine back in 1983 and finally found one encounter that is similar to the one I had in a few ways. I was gobsmacked and couldn't believe I was finally going to read about someone else's encounter that happened in such a similar way and seemed to have been carried out by either similar or the exact same creatures. I have lived my life in fear ever since this happened to me, but now it seems like coming forward with a story like mine is trendy and not as taboo as it has been up until this point. It's a huge relief and may even be a way for me to finally gain some understanding of or find some answers to what happened to me. I've lived with this experience inside me for all these years, and I had recently come to the conclusion that perhaps I really was insane, and what happened to me had been all in my mind. While it's true, a friend was with me throughout the entire encounter for the most part. He refused to ever speak of it even to me, and he eventually decided that it was some sort of hallucination that must have been brought on by drinking creek water. I guess that's what he had to tell himself to try and make some sense of it all. I always knew 
that what happened to us was real. And now that I found an encounter that gives me some validation, I feel like it's finally time for me to talk about what happened to me that day and tell my story. I grew up in Washington State, and the encounter happened when I was 16 years old. My friend Mitch and I spent almost every second of that summer together as we were both outcasts and not welcome in any other cliques in our high school. So he and I were our own little clique, and we were admittedly kind of weird. Nowadays, we wouldn't have been such outcasts, but back then, we were somewhat ahead of our time with all of our interests in horror and science fiction movies and comics, anything having to do with outer space, and most specifically, extraterrestrials in general. Sure, these kinds of things were popular among a lot of kids our age at the time, but we took it to a whole new level because we were convinced that aliens were real and that they were always watching us. We would even pretend while we were out in the woods that we would call the extraterrestrials to us and they would come down in their ships and take us with them. We had no idea what we were messing around with and have often wondered throughout the years if we somehow did in fact unwittingly call them to us somehow. We spent almost all of our free time in the woods down the street from my house, which connected to the woods that surrounded my property. We knew the entire area like, like the backs of our hands, and we never thought anything of being alone in the middle of the dense and desolate woods. Our parents didn't think anything was wrong with it either, and assumed he and I were just going through some sort of strange phase as boys do. Boys will be boys with my mother's explanation for everything, and my father just seemed to go along with her about most of it. One day in the middle of summer, Mitch was spending yet another night at my house, and we had easily convinced my parents to let us camp out in the backyard. We had initially tried to get them to allow us to go a little further into the woods and set up camp, but they wouldn't budge. The backyard to my house was the best we were going to get, and so we took it. We waited until it was almost nightfall to set up our small tent and built a little fire. My mother packed us snacks, and we brought along flashlights and comic books about superheroes and extraterrestrials. It was going to be a fun night, and it was something we did every so often so we weren't frightened at all when we were out there. We stayed up until about one in the morning and just hung out. We read our comics and joked around a little bit, all of the normal things that we would always do. The both of us briefly mentioned at one point or another a want to go into the woods and explore them late at night. Now, while neither of us were normally scared of the backyard or the surrounding woods, we admittedly had never gone into them in the middle of the night before. It was almost like it had never even occurred to us before to do so. Even the times when we had camped out in the yard before, we had never even considered going out into the woods alone. Initially, we dismissed this notion though we were able to fall asleep quickly when we were finally tired enough to do so. It was around two in the morning when we both jumped up at the same time. Neither one of us knew what had woken us up, but we did immediately think that it was strange we had both not only woken up at the same time, but jumped from where we were sleeping, as though something or someone had startled us somehow. There were no noises outside of the tent, which was a little unusual, because normally there would, at the very least, be owls and other night critters running and flapping about. Not this time, though. Despite being a cool night, it also seemed as though the wind had stopped blowing altogether as well. It was eerie, and the two of us were both immediately hyper-aware. We got out of the tent just to check 
and make sure that there wasn't any sort of dangerous predator anywhere in the backyard or near our tent. We both had medium-sized flashlights with fresh batteries, and we didn't see anything right away. One of us, and I can't remember which one, looked up and saw that there was a giant light beaming down from the sky, seemingly coming from out of nowhere and shining down onto something that looked to be about half a mile or so into the woods from where we were in my backyard. It was the strangest thing, but we had seen similar things many times in our comic books. And at first, we were excited with the idea that perhaps a real-life extraterrestrial craft was nearby. We stupidly but excitedly decided immediately to go and try to find the spot where the light was beaming onto. This was a foolish decision, I know, and I honestly still wonder if we were compelled or something because we didn't even give a second thought to the warnings we had received from my parents earlier in the night about the trouble we would be in should we decide to leave the tent and go into the woods. We took off running into the woods in case my parents were to see us somehow and try to stop us. They were surely sleeping by that time of the night, but we wanted to be sure. It's like we absolutely had to get to that light. Once we reached the woods, we slowed down a bit and tried to follow the trails as best as we could in order to find the craft and shining light beam that was coming from it. Understand. We didn't see any craft in the sky, but we were assuming that was where the beam was emanating from. I honestly don't think we actually thought that it was going to end up being a real UFO, but we were hopeful and young, and we just wanted to have a little fun with it. The beam of light, though shining down in one spot, was so bright that we didn't even need our flashlight even as such distance away as we were. We made our way directly to it without any issue or problem, but once we were about 50 feet from where the light had landed, we saw something that stopped us in our tracks. Right underneath the light, there was a ship there, and now that we were close, we could see it. But looking back, I believed it was cloaked. However, it seems we had gotten close enough that we could finally see it. It was saucer-shaped and huge. It was about the size of an average American football field and looked like it had windows all around it. It was just hovering there, not making any noise, and right below it were three creatures. At first, we could only see these things from the back and they seemed to be trying to lift some sort of large boulder into the light beam. Mitch and I both gasped when we saw them, and they must have heard us because they immediately stopped whatever it was they were doing and turned around. As they did so, they let go of the boulder and it hovered there in midair and was then quickly sucked up into the ship. I cannot explain how this worked because the boulder seemed much too large to be able to even remotely fit through the tiny opening of the ship, but that's exactly what happened, and I watched it with my own eyes. The beings were a whole other story. They were pointing what looked like ray guns we always saw in our comic books and the science fiction movies we watched, and they had them aimed right at us. We could see little orange dots on our chest where the weapons were pointed. We froze, put our hands in the air, and dropped our flashlights in the process. The beings were approximately two feet tall and had what looked like antenna on their heads. However, it wasn't really like it was their heads, or at least I don't know if it was or not, because it looked like they had on some sort of strange suit. It was the weirdest thing, and I don't understand it, but they looked like they had on a homemade costume of what someone would have thought a robot looked like back then. I often wonder if they were projecting themselves to look like something we were familiar with. Anyway, at first they just stared at us, but then Mitch spoke, 
He said what we thought you were supposed to say to aliens. When you meet them, and that was, we come in peace. This seemed to throw these beings into an absolute frenzy. They started all blabbering to one another in a language I had never heard before, and they were wildly running around, hands and arms flailing in the air. It was somewhat comical, and it would have made me laugh had it been something I saw on television or in one of my comics. However, this was really happening, and Mitch and I were scared senseless. Mitch and I just watched this, and we stood there totally frozen, and with our hands in the air for a good three minutes before we put them down and started to think about how we were going to get out of there. Neither one of us said a word, but we both knew what the other guy was thinking. It was like they had read our minds or something, because as soon as we thought to run, the beings suddenly stopped the craziness and blubbering. They all turned to us again. Then they started running towards us. We turned and started running back to my house, and we both had every intention of going directly inside and locking the doors once we had done so. They were making weird noises and ran abnormally slowly, even for how small they were. At least that's what I remember thinking at the time. Then the unthinkable happened. I turned to make sure my best friend was still behind me, and that's right when I got blasted with one of the ray guns. I don't know what happened next. I completely blacked out, and when I woke up, I was back inside of the tent, and it was daylight outside. Both my watch and Mitch's watch stopped at 3.17 in the morning, and neither would ever work again. I asked Mitch what the heck had happened, and when he didn't respond right away, I felt stupid and thought it had all been a bad dream. I felt burning in the center of my back, though, and asked him to take a look at it. He seemed stunned and kind of like he was in shock, but he slowly turned and looked at my back. There was a large burn there, and that's when we both knew we hadn't been having the same dreams or sharing some sort of hallucination but that what had happened really did, and we were terrified. I started asking questions, and he and I realized we had both witnessed the exact same thing. The only difference is, he said that once I was zapped with a ray gun or whatever, it actually was that I was shot with, I still don't know, I disappeared. Then he felt as though he were falling, and we woke up back in the tent, and there we sat. Mitch didn't have any marks on him, and I'm not sure why I was the one that was zapped. Maybe it's because I looked back and he didn't dare. He was behind me, though, so he really had no reason to look behind him. We already knew what was back there, and though at first it was exciting, it ended up being the most terrifying and traumatic experience of our lives, and remained exactly that to this day. Our backpacks of food and all of our comics were missing, and we never found the flashlight. Whether or not this had anything to do with the aliens, I don't know. I was terrified, but exhilarated, and wanted to do nothing but to go over what had happened, time and time again. Mitch didn't feel quite the same way, and he was almost in a state of shock. He had terrible PTSD to this day because this isn't something we could have talked about with any of the grown-ups in our lives, and we really didn't have any friends besides each other to run it by. I eventually let it go when I realized how messed up Mitch was about the whole thing and kept it held in all those years. Of course, I've done as much research as possible, even back when all I had to work with was the local library. But like I mentioned in the beginning, it wasn't until about a month ago that I came across someone who was also zapped by one of these guns, and it's been reported that he disappeared and then reappeared in a different spot in the same area, in front of several witnesses, and with no recollection at all as to what actually happened to him or where he went when he seemingly just ceased to exist after being blasted. That encounter opened up a whole new world for me. 
I haven't had any other experiences with the extraterrestrial that I can remember. But ever since that night so long ago, I have constant nightmares about being stalked through the woods or experimented on by the exact same beings. In the nightmares, these creatures are being overseen by what we have now come to know as the reptilian extraterrestrial race, and it's terrifying. I have been told recently that perhaps I actually experienced these things, but they are being screened to look and feel like nightmares to me. Maybe that's the truth, and it all began that night out in the woods. The nightmares always take place in the middle of the night in the woods surrounding the house I live in now. There's a lot more to these nightmares. I wonder still, if we were chosen and called into the woods somehow, and for what reason. I often also wonder if perhaps we had called them with all of our games about being with extraterrestrials in those very woods. I have no way of knowing. A friend of mine put me in touch with someone who is well-known and world-renowned for these types of hypnotic regressions, and I will definitely let you know what I uncover about it once I go through with it. It's a big step because there's a huge chance that so much more happened that we can't remember. That's really all I have to tell about my experience as of right now. Thank you for your time and for giving me an outlet, finally. Feeling cozy? I post new videos every single day, so if you subscribe and hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when all those videos go live. Okay, on to the next one. Four friends saw and heard an eight-foot-tall creature plow through the trees while they were out fishing. This was on the north side of Lake Ray Robert in Cook County. The boys had camped by the lake, and at 1.30 a.m., they decided to go fishing. About one mile from their campsite, they had felt they were being watched. At first, they thought it was kids or a ranger. When they called out, no one answered. They got back to their truck at a dead run, and then noticed trees moving behind them. They got the mag light out and saw the tall grass that was pushed down like a deer had bedded there. They then heard a loud, unnatural scream. They turned the light and saw a shape plowing through the trees. The boys all left the area in a hurry. The next night, they were back with more guns and shotguns as well as a spotlight. At the same time as the night before, the scream occurred. It was further away, and then there was another scream only a few feet away. They got the spotlight and lit up the area and saw it running away from them. It was eight feet tall and stood straight up with its back to them. One of the boys shot it with a shotgun and was sure that he hit it, but it only let out another scream and continued running. Then it pushed a younger cottonwood tree over. The boys then left. On to the next one. I live in Northeast Texas, close to the town of Commerce. I was witness to several incidents when I lived just outside Commerce. At the time, I was employed for the Delta County Sheriff's Department as a deputy. I and a friend were in the business of buying dairy calves to raise and resell. My friend lived in an area close to the town of Horton. The actual town is now underwater, part of Cooper's Lake. This was a very remote area of dense, thick woods running all the way to Sulphur Springs. My friend began finding his calves dead at the barn. It appeared their necks had been broken. This all came to a head on an evening as he heard his boar hog squealing loudly from the pen. The pen was located at the edge of the woods. My friend had a very mean boar hog that weighed around 400 pounds. He called me on the phone and told me to come over as fast as I could. When I arrived, he was almost in shock and told me that he went and grabbed his rifle and went to the barn. He said that he saw a tall, hairy creature lifting this boar hog over the pallet fence. My friend fired a shot at it 
and it dropped the hog and ran off. My father and I went to the pen and found a set of tracks. These resembled a very large human foot in the dirt. My father, a retired Dallas police officer, contacted my friend's neighbor. The neighbor was also a retired police officer and professor at Northeast Texas Community College. He came and called a couple of his students, and plaster casts were made of the print. Several pictures were taken of the cast, and one was even printed in the local newspaper. The cast went on display at the college in the science department. As we were talking with my friend's neighbor, he advised that he oversaw a cabin across from him bordering my friend's land way back in the woods. The owner had said that strange things were happening at this place. We saw that the tracks went due east toward this other piece of property. We went to the cabin and saw several more of the footprints going in a circle around the cabin. Over time, we saw and measured two other sets of tracks. The only size I remember was 12 inches. The other tracks were bigger than the set we cast. The strange happenings always started in the spring and continued until late fall. His property is about two miles from the Horton Bottoms, where I know several people who have seen this creature, but would not go public for fear of being thought crazy. One was chased out of the bottoms while duck hunting at a slough. I have since moved to a different part of the country. About eight years ago, a friend and I were walking along the Sulphur River and found tracks going to the water as if to get something to drink. I have been a law enforcement officer in this area for 13 years. At first, I told a couple of people of what I had seen and most thought I was crazy. Thanks to the internet, I can relay this story. We continued to find tracks on this part of the property. My friend and I hunted on it until we had an encounter. We didn't see anything, but whatever it was, kept moving in a circle around us. It was not worried about making noise as most wild animals do. There were a total of five witnesses, including myself and my father, who were called to the scene by my friend, the professor, my friend's neighbor, who was called by my dad, and two students who was called by the professor. Weather was clear and warm in a wooded area close to the Sulphur River. I have a friend who has lived in the bottoms all of his life. He is a retired government employee. He has seen the tracks and creature many times. In fact, he was chased out of the swamp where he was hunting ducks. On to the next one. On McKinney Bridge Road near Pilot Point in Denton County in Texas. Late one summer night, two friends and myself were riding around the back roads between Pilot Point and Aubrey, Texas. B was driving J and myself around in his new Chevy truck. All three of us were 17-year-old seniors at Aubrey High School. We decided to head down the McKinney Bridge Road to where the old bridge was out across the creek. We had been down this road and hung out where a dead end on several occasions, mostly to scare girls and such. This night, we stopped just to relieve ourselves and we were just plain bored. We all stepped out and went to the steel barricade that blocked vehicles from driving off into the creek. I went to the middle front of the truck, Jay off to the right, which was north. Later, after discussing the account, this was when B said he felt like something was watching him. B did not feel the need to pass this on to Jay and myself for reasons still not known. B also locked the doors to the truck when he got back in. After finishing up our task, we both noticed B back in the truck and made some jokes about his lack of courage. I did notice that it was a very dark night with no moon, so anything outside the truck's light was just black. Jay and myself started loudly making jungle noises as they echoed down to the creek bottom. It was at this point I suddenly had this overwhelming feeling that something was watching me, and it was close. I didn't want to seem panicked after just getting through making fun of B, but I wanted back in the truck right then and there. I later learned that Jay suddenly felt as if something was watching him at the same moment I had felt it 
As I walked back around the truck, I was looking off to the north where I felt the presence of whatever was going on. Not looking where I was going, I ran right into Jay, who was also staring toward the north into the pitch black woods where he felt it coming from. When I hit Jay, he let out a yell and jumped in, which I also reacted with my own yells, and we exchanged multiple four-letter words. After a few seconds, we started laughing and trying to catch our breath. At this moment, we both heard what I describe as a low growl-like sound that ended in an oomph-like sound. We both stopped, and I got out. Did you hear that? When it let out a loud, screeching roar that turned to a low roar. To this, Jay and myself panicked and made for the truck. The truck doors, however, were still locked by our friend B, who was just sitting there looking at us with wide-eyed fear on his face as we screamed like little girls trying to get the darn door open. The truck had manual locks, so apparently leaning over and letting us in was too much to ask. I, of course, had no idea they were locked as I tried to rip the door handle off the truck, all the while screaming, God knows what. I jumped in the back of the truck and made my way to the driver's side to get in, while Jay tried in vain to work the passenger side. I pounded on the glass, screaming for B to let me in, and all I got was a panicked, crazed look like he had never seen me before in his entire life. Jay and I, at this point, jumped in the bed and were beating on the roof for B to go. B was in such a panic, he could not keep the clutch pushed in on his truck because his leg was shaking so bad his foot would slip. We heard the thunk, thunk, thunk each time his foot came off the pedal. He finally got the truck started, and we exited the area at a very high rate of speed. We told the story to several people, who, if they didn't dismiss it right off, played it off as we heard a coyote or a raccoon, and we just got scared. One of our football coaches insisted it was a cougar. He told us they make a sound like a woman screaming. That's what we heard. Between the three of us, we never bought the cougar explanation. What we heard sounded like King Kong, not a screaming cat. The sound was so loud you could feel it in your chest. It seemed to be no more than 20 feet from us, much like I've heard a male lion do at the zoo. And the feeling of being watched was what got to me the most. I've never had that sort of reaction to anything like that before. All the hair on my neck and arms stood up before I even heard a sound. Not to mention, it happened to three of us at the same time. We never really had any closure or a chance at closure on that night until several years later when I ran across Bigfoot encounters online. Now we are convinced we crossed paths with a Bigfoot. The screaming roar was pretty unusual. It was late night, at least midnight. It was a dark, moonless, late summer night with pleasant weather. We were in short, right at the old McKinney Bridge. It's a very wooded area on the creek bottom. The Lake Ray Roberts Greenbelt is now located directly on the west side of the creek. On to the next one. Near Kenneflick in Liberty County in Texas, my mother and I and one of my friends were traveling north on the FM 1008 between Dayton and Kennefick, Texas. I believe it was late evening or early night. All three of us watched a very tall creature completely covered with hair from head to toe standing at the side of the road and disappear into the woods. All three of us saw the same thing. It was clear, late evening with mixed woods. On to the next one. This happened when I was about 16 years old. I was growing up in Indiana in a house right off the edge of the woods. While playing fetch outside with my dog, I threw the ball further than I meant to and it went close to the wood line. My dog went running for it but stopped suddenly and ran home faster than I ever saw him run before and without a single bark or any other sound coming from him. No matter what, he wouldn't come back when I called him. I never saw him do that before, so I ran after him to check up on him. He went ahead of me and hid himself in the house before I could catch up with him. When I finally found him, 
There was nothing wrong with him. As far as I could tell, he wouldn't make any noise and just kept quiet where he was hiding. I couldn't figure out why he was so scared. Since he wouldn't come out anymore, we had to stop playing fetch. Even as a kid, I didn't like losing things, so I went back out to where I threw the ball to get it back. After I found it and picked it up, not too far from me, there were some noises, like something was moving through the bushes and on the forest floor debris. I looked over in time to see a giant creature with lots of shaggy-looking brown hair all over, walking away and going further into the woods. I had no idea it was even there. I never had the chance to see it from the front or see its face, so I couldn't be completely sure of what it was. What I did see was that it walked on two legs and was very large. It moved very fast through the woods and was gone in seconds. On to the next one. Travis is an avid Bigfoot hunter. He loves to go looking and listening in the woods. He made three trips into the same area near Redfish Lake, once in August and twice in September, and had some amazing experiences each time. The first trip in the hills, he was hiking with his wife Becky, his little brother Brad, and his older brother Steve as well as his son and daughter. He was trying a little tree knocking, knocking a branch against another branch to see if he could receive a response from Bigfoot. He didn't hear or see anything. On the way out of the woods, there was a large tree ripped out and left along the trail. You could see that the tree had grown out of the side of a hill. The roots were twisted out, not cut, and it had previously grown at an angle. It was lying in the trail, and it definitely wasn't there when we went up the mountain. The next day, they hiked up to Lake Kramer, knowing it was their last day there. As he hiked with his wife, Travis noticed a beautiful area of the trail and thought to himself, if he were a Bigfoot, that is exactly where he would go. So he left the trail and climbed down the hill. Looking back on this now, I think it was an incredibly stupid thing to do. If I had been hurt, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, to get me out of there. He said while hiking down the mountain, he heard an enormous crash that sounded as though it had been made on purpose. There was no residual echo or any indication about what made the noise or where it had come from. He knew he needed to get going and get off the mountain. So he set his camera on his shoulder and filmed the area around him as they walked out. Later, he had a friend take the film apart frame by frame, and as he looked at the frames one by one, he could clearly see a Bigfoot moving slowly to remain out of his sight. He was hooked. He convinced his wife to hike up Redfish Lake with him one more time to see if he could find tracks or any sign of the Bigfoot. They were about three quarters of the way up the mountain when they heard a boulder crashing down the mountain. At least it was something that sounded like a boulder coming down the mountain. My wife was pretty spooked. I'm praying to see a Bigfoot, and she is praying we won't see one. Eventually, his wife convinced him that they needed to go down the mountain. He reluctantly agreed. He wanted to have one last look at the area off the trail he previously hiked, so he left his pack with his wife and hiked down the hill. The last time Terry was able to go to the mountains before the snow came, he could only convince his brother-in-law to go with him. The trip was fairly uneventful, but they did find some large rocks that had been hefted out of the ground. They were big enough that there was no way a man could have lifted them. Further along the trail, coming down, he found another full-grown tree that had been taken out of the ground completely, roots and all, and leaned across the same trail they had just traveled up not more than 20 minutes prior. That was pretty amazing. The tree still had moist dirt on the roots. Travis still loved to go hiking, and Redfish Lake is still a favorite destination, but it's becoming harder to find people who will go up with him. They are more than a little concerned that if they run into a Bigfoot, Travis will want to meet him personally. On to the next one. 
Ryder was camping at a family reunion. He woke up in the middle of the night and could smell something horrible. His first concern was for the children that were camping in a smaller tent outside his bigger tent. He figured his dog would have barked a warning or something, but the dogs weren't even disturbed. He couldn't find his flashlight, so he got the camp stove going, a wood-burning unit inside the tent. As soon as the logs started burning, the Bigfoot and the smell were gone. It's pretty up there, Ryder said. There is a lot of water and trees. It is beautiful. You come out of that canyon, and it opens up into the desert. I imagine it was a nice place for them up there. On to the next one. Ryder and a friend were elk hunting above McKay at a camp called Loristica near Pass Creek and had been there for six days without seeing anyone else. In the middle of the night, about 4 or 4.30 the second night, they awoke to a distinct smell, a very bad smell, like something musky or dead, only three times worse. When we would move, the smell would leave. Twenty geodes? Silverware and a pocket knife went missing off their table at night. His friend kept blaming him for the gear disappearing, but Ryder knew he hadn't taken it. There were two bucks hanging in the tree, but they weren't disturbed. A group of guys on horseback carrying CB radios rode past Ryder and his friend. He heard them say they saw something that looked like a bear, but they weren't going to shoot it. They weren't sure what it was, but they were telling each other to be careful. The third incident occurred after two nights of smell, so Ryder and his friend were already on the alert. On to the next one. The Lamb family was having their annual camping trip up Sawmill Canyon, which is about 40 minutes west of Howe. It was later in the evening when the family was cooking their supper over an open fire. The children were running around and playing Everything seemed fine until the hot dogs started disappearing faster than they should have. My son was five and my nephew was two. They were playing and the adults were cooking. I noticed all the hot dogs had disappeared. I asked my son if he knew what happened to them. He said we gave them to our friend. She said she questioned him thoroughly. Where is your friend? In the back of the truck, he said. She said his answer shook her up because... There had been bears sighted shortly before they left home for their trip. Several of the adults in the party went to check the back of the pickup the boys pointed out, but all they found was an area where the dust had been wiped clean in the back. We looked around with flashlights, but didn't see anything. That area has a lot of trees, and it felt a little weird out there, like someone was watching us. She said they went back near the fire and questioned her son some more, asking him what he had been doing with the hot dogs and whether he was scared. He said it had hands. He didn't put the hot dog in its mouth. He gave it to its hands. He said they were pretending that they were running a restaurant feeding their customers. It didn't scare them at all. They were having fun with a friend. Later that night, when everyone went to bed, there were several disturbances. They knew then the Bigfoot hadn't really left the area. We knew something climbed into the pickup truck because the hitch would screech. We checked the truck each time, but didn't see anything. Something also kept knocking on the tent, hitting it. You could hear it shuffling around outside. We didn't ever see anything after that, but I was jittery and scared the whole trip. My son wasn't the least bit scared, though. Years later, when the family brought up the subject of the Bigfoot on this particular trip, the young man assured them that his friend had hands like his and it wasn't scary at all. On to the next one. Near Minerva in Carroll, Columbiana and Stark Counties, the family and friends of Miss Evelyn Clayton were out on the front porch when they heard noises coming from the direction of the old chicken coop just to the right of the house. They then saw two pairs of yellow eyes that seemed to be reflecting the porch light. Scott Patterson went up to his car and turned the headlights on to get a better look. The eyes belonged to two cougar-type felines. 
Then the group saw what appeared to be a large, bipedal, hairy creature step in front of the cat as if to protect them. The creature then proceeded to lurch toward the Patterson's car. The witness fled to the house and called the sheriff, and while they were waiting for the deputies, the humanoid appeared at the kitchen window. Patterson then pointed a 22 caliber pistol at it while Evelyn loaded a 22 caliber rifle. They decided they would not shoot it unless the creature made any advances toward them. It suddenly left without harming anyone. There was a strong stench resembling ammonia sulfur which remained in the area long after the creature was gone. On to the next one. Near Germantown, Ohio, there were weird things that happened in our area while growing up. There were some footprints, but I'm sure they were made by a guy from a neighboring farm. There had been a lot of talk previously to this about strange things going on in the area. They included several cattle found dead in the field, and their carcasses had been heavily scavenged. But there were no known large predators or dog packs in the area. No bears had been seen in this area since the early 1900s. There was some unexplained property damage to unattended buildings and barn, yet no property was taken. Also, there were accounts similar to what I saw online. Reports such as high-pitched whistles and unusual growling sounds. I myself had an unnerving experience while fishing on the Twin Creek near Gratis, Ohio, about 10 miles east of Germantown. My dog was with me and I noticed that he was acting funny, meaning that he did little or no exploring and roaming around the area I was in, as he was accustomed to doing. I thought maybe some other people were fishing nearby because he kept looking across the creek into a heavily wooded bottom area at the base of a 90-foot cliff. Occasionally, he would snort or growl a bit. It was approaching dark and we started home about one and a half miles through woods and a small cornfield. It was getting darker and my imagination started making me nervous, especially since the dog kept looking back in the direction we had come. Being only 15 did not help matters either. When the trail approached a thick stand of cedar trees, the dog suddenly stopped and growled, trailing off into a whimper and backing away. I froze but I could not see or hear anything. Then, from within the theaters, I heard a few twigs snap. Not a loud, heavy sound, but it was enough. I took off running around the theater grove, looking back constantly for about three quarters of a mile until I reached the cornfield behind our house. The dog stayed right with me the whole way. I never saw anything, but I don't know. That recollection never ceases to remind me how scared I was. Anyway, I don't know if this helped. I thought you might be interested. Also, about four years before this incident, one of our neighbors, who was home alone with her kids, called and told my dad that there was a lot of snarling and strange noises behind her house. This was about 11 p.m., and my father went over with a shotgun but found nothing, but did hear a lot of rustling in the woods. The police were called but also found nothing. The specific incident was adjacent to Twin Creek, about three quarters of a mile downstream from an abandoned gravel pit in a bottomed area. Lots of heavy willow, cedar, and locust patches, about half a mile from the nearest house. The area floods over every couple of years, so no other homes are there, and the one house has since been leveled. There is a large cornfield approximately 300 plus yards from where I was fishing at the base of a dirt cliff. The overall area is classic Ohio, lots of big fields, lots of patches, large and small of thick woods, lots of creeks. On to the next one. In Summit County in Ohio, I was playing hide and go seek with my sisters and their friends around September. I was nine at the time. We were living in Talmadge, Ohio at the time of the incident. We were all inside the house and it was my turn to find them. It was getting dark outside, so my mom told us to stay inside and play. Well, I covered my eyes and began counting and my sisters went and hid. When I began to search for them, I could not find them 
though I figured that they went outside even though they were not supposed to. Out the door I went. We had a lot of woods behind my house with a grove of large pines. It was just about dark by now and I thought I saw something move in the trees on the outside of our property. I snuck around the trees to find my sister and as I got closer to what was behind the trees, it moved away from me, staying one step ahead of me. I tried to catch up to it, thinking it was my sister. I ran around the pines and could just catch a glimpse of it in the trees. I finally gave up and stood by a tree, exhausted. All of a sudden, the tree gently moved behind me, and I turned around and looked through the pine tree. I saw a set of large eyes staring at me with a dark-shaped face. It was then that I realized it wasn't my sister. I stared at it and it moved slowly around the tree and it moved to the other side and we kept eye contact. Then I heard a weird high-pitched noise in the back of the trees and it ran off. Then I realized it wasn't my sister and I ran like heck back to the house. When I got inside, all my sisters and friends were there and they said they never left the house and hid with my mom in her room. She said they were there the whole time. I'm 34 years old now, and to this day, I can honestly say that I saw a young Bigfoot that day. It had to be, because when we made eye contact, it wasn't much bigger than I was. A high-pitched noise was heard. It was right before dark. The full moon was out. It was in a pine forest. A lot of vines were present in the woods. On to the next one. Penobscot, primary tribal range, is the state of Maine. From the 1935 Journal of American Folklore, in an article written by Frank G. Speck, titled, Penobscot, Tales and Religious Belief, are details to the strange being, referred among the Penobscot tribes as Kiwakwe. As he goes on to note in the article, the occasion was opportune because there were then a score or more of aged First Nations whose lifespan reached back to the days when European influence had not deeply affected their economic life. The railroad had not yet spread to the network of highways across the old hunting grounds of the tribe. The northern forests had not been wasted and burned in the frenzied process of exploitation for lumber and pulp. From the first story in the article actually titled Supernatural Creatures and Phenomena of the Wilderness, the author notes description of Kiwakwe going about in the woods is one of a race of horrid cannibal giants who wander through the forest solitude. We learn from the tales they are male and female. A curious story brought forth by the author in the article from Penobscot Storytelling relates the following details of Kiwakwe. A man and his wife and a little girl were living far from other people in the woods. They heard someone coming. Suddenly, a noise was heard in the smoke hole of the wigwam, and looking up, they saw a Kiwakwe peering down. This seems to be a similar observation to what the Coeur d'Alene tribe in Idaho say about giants who would occasionally peer down through a teepee smoke hole from time to time. The trouble is, the Penobscot actually live in the far reaches of the Upper East Coast on the opposite side of America, a considerable distance from Idaho. So, we can conclude without reasonable doubt that these are both genuine, detailed observations having nothing to do with tribal relations. Further details of Kiwakwe, as mentioned from the article, are as follows. He possesses such power of voice that his yells kill the human hearer. Kiwakwe is indeed an ogre held in much dread. The mere sight of his enormous imprint in the rocks or earth was formerly enough to cause the evacuation of the neighborhood. The author notes the observation of stone coat construction and similar details also given by so many other eastern tribes. He goes on to explain, In some accounts, the monster is covered with skin of stone. In others, he is said to coat himself with the balsam pitch three inches thick 
by rolling in a bed of pitch while it is soft. Another observation is made in the female variant of the same described animal known to the Penobscot as Squatemus and Sugdemus. As the author writes the following details, Sawaktemus, Swamp Woman, is a female being clad only in moss with long flowing moss hair covering her form. Evidently, this is the same creature as Sukdemus. She is occasionally heard moaning and crying in the depths of some lonely tract of forest. It is thought well to avoid her. A female creature, Sukdemus, is, according to some, the same as Squatemus. She is often heard crying or wailing near the camp, trying to lure a hunter. Whoever pities her and goes to her is likely never to return. It is even a danger to think of her when alone in the forest, as the author notes. If one even wishes ardently for her, it is said she will come to him. She is also mentioned to children as one who will carry them off if they wander alone from the camps and houses. Of spirit and demon places named, the author writes, the old Penobscot had a superstition against ascending to the top of Mount Katahdin before so many spirits lived there capable of inflicting harm. The First Nations formerly had aversions to ascending all mountains for similar reasons, as it was thought best to avoid spirit or demon-haunted locales. The author writes of Penobscot beliefs and rituals relative to certain spirits believed to haunt the spring as is also noted from the text, springs are likewise haunted by particular local spirits, for which reason it was formerly the rule, and still is with some, to make an offering of tobacco when drinking at a remote spring in the wood. In a story titled, The Abandoned Boy Escapes from the Cannibal Sorceress, there are still Hollywood-type details in the Native American storytelling given to further enhance what we may now come to know more strongly as a Bigfoot or Sasquatch, showing that this was a creature that the Penobscot were very much familiar with in ways we may never know or understand. They didn't mind showing us the way they had felt about what we can only assume was the creature's repulsive nature. Even if overcharacterized, the Kuakwe, we can very much assume the way that the Penobscot felt given the repulsive details from the following story, unless they just really liked the idea of pointing fun at a very old and ancient enemy, one in which they could never actually get. In the following story, the same beings called Kiwakwesque and is referred to as the woman wandering in the wood. According to the story, she was a cannibal. In the story, she has a boy who lives with her whom she was fattening up to be her meal at some point. As the story also says, she always kept her back turned toward him, never letting him behold her face. When she handed him anything, she passed it to him behind her back. The boy fools the Kiwakwiskwe into thinking he is asleep so that he can see her face. When he finally does see her, he beholds a gruesome sight. As the story notes, the poor boy was frightened almost to death for she had already eaten off both of her lips as far as she could reach with her teeth. As the boy then makes an escape some distance away, he can hear the Kiwaskwe exclaim under her breath, The world isn't big enough for you to escape me. Soon I will overtake you, then you will die. The Kiwaskwe is killed in pursuit of the boy after having fallen into the rapids of a busy stream. She then wakes up from death, spits out a mouthful of maggot, apparently having been left for dead for quite some time, exclaims, why indeed I fell asleep, and then continues in her pursuit of the boy, more dreadful than ever before. As the boy finally reaches his grandfather's house, he is shocked at what is revealed to him. According to his grandfather, the boy had been abducted by the Kuakwit Squit when he was still a baby. The old man then tells the boy that evil spirit woman, as it happened, stole you when you were small. She took you away from me when I was alone. The old man also informs the boy that both of his parents are still alive. The story seems to suggest 
that Bigfoot or Sasquatch kidnaps grandchildren from old people when their backs are turned. Incidentally, a number of very real missing person cases in books such as Missing 411, Western United States and Canada, and Missing 411, Eastern United States by David Pallades seems to indicate a similar pattern of infants and very young children going missing while in the company of their grandparents when being in or very close to secluded forest areas. In another story of the same article titled Kiwakwe the Cannibal Giant, it is written of Kiwakwe. He roams the forest seeking people to devour. He is covered with a shell through which no bullet or arrow can go. He covered himself by rolling about in balsam pitch until he had a coating three inches thick. The story also makes the suggestion that Kiwakwe prefers the liver of its victims over all other parts of the body. In another story titled The Origin of Maskisu Toad Woman gives further details to a strange being who is referred to as Maskisu or Toad Woman, who, which in fact may actually be and probably is the same beings as all the others which have previously been mentioned so far. In the story, the Maskisu seeks the child of a hunter. As soon as the hunter leaves his camp, in fact, it may have actually been watching over the camp the whole time. As the hunter then returns to his camp, he sees the monster caressing his child. So he takes back his baby and chases Maskisu away into the surrounding forest according to the story. She went off crying dismally and then became the creature of the woods. Her caresses are fatal to the children whom she reaches. People camping in the wood have been careful of their children on account of the swamp woman. In another story titled The Bear Abduction, it starts off with the story of a young boy who, and according to the story, when he was old enough to walk, he went with his father and mother to pick blueberries. When they reached a place where the berries were plentiful, they left the child and went a short distance. When the mother went back to see if the child was all right, she could not find her baby. She called her husband, and they made a search, but could not find him. Then the story mentioned, a bear carried him away. The bear took care of the baby for seven years. The bear became the mother of the child. One day, the bear spoke to the child and told him that the hunters were after him and that he would be killed. But before he was killed, he would take him to his parents. The bear abductor then brings the boy back home to his parents. The bear took the boy near the home of his parents, and when they found the child, he could not speak. It took him a few years to learn. He could not remember when the bear had taken him away. There are still similar unassociated current observations of so-called bear abductions in Missing 411 Western United States and Canada, as well as Missing 411 Eastern United States by David Pallades not to mention all of the other various Native American tribes with similar stories throughout the book. According to the entire article from this edition of the Journal of American Folklore, the Penobscot have also many detailed stories and descriptions of a broad list of other animals, which we already know are real and do in fact exist. Some of the other animals also mentioned from the same article include woodpeckers, loons, kingfishers, beavers, herons, bears, rabbits, muskrats, porcupines, raccoon, foxes, frogs, snakes, panthers, deers, and stories of fishers, a kind of weasel, killing rabbit. These are all real animals and animal observations. Why then should we consider Kiwakwe, Squatemis, Skidemis, Kiwakwesque, Kiwakwe, and Maskisu as anything different that just does not exist and yet somehow holds a place in Penobscot storytelling. The likes of which give us so much detail that it fits modern observations which a different people are once again barely beginning to come around to. Doesn't it seem rather interesting that when we add all of the strange characteristics together that they appear to equal the identity of the same described thing? I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, 
so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!